Chris Lucas is one of those business owners that loves to break the rules. He also refuses to copy what others do and has an uncanny ability to see opportunities where others don't. And guess what? He is ridiculously successful. Before we immerse ourselves in episode 382 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, the marketing gold is made possible thanks to Open Universities Australia and 52ways.biz. When was the last time you learned something that could propel your business forward? Outside of listening to this show, and thank you for that, your answer may well be, not in a very, very long time, Timbo. Well, that's cool but maybe it's time that changed. Check out Open University's online courses over at open.edu.au. Someone's got to be the smartest in your industry. It may as well be you. And we're also made possible thanks to Dale Beaumont's 52 Ways live event that's touring Australia and New Zealand in 2018. Yes, folks, the 2018 dates have been announced. You have no excuses to not book a seat. It's one very, very full day where Dale hands you on a platter 52 ways to grow that business, that beautiful business of yours. Grab your free tickets now for you and a mate or two over at 52, that's 52ways.biz. I said, welcome to a small business marketing show Where successful small business owners share their souls To take your marketing straight to the lead Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie And welcome back to the Small Business Big Marketing Show The number one marketing podcast in Australia Thanks to the Apple iTunes Store And also available on Virgin Airlines In case you didn't know I'm your host, Timbo Reed, but you, so much more importantly, are a motivated business owner ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. Big show today. Melbourne's king of casual dining, Chris Lucas, shares how he's built a culinary empire. I'll show you where to look for ideas to get more customers, and it won't be where you think. And we revisit an episode in which my guest built an entire business around JOMO, the joy of missing out. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. I haven't answered a listener question for quite a few episodes, and I do enjoy doing it. They are piling up. You can send them to me, tim at timreid, R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. So I thought I'd tackle one today. I like this one. The listener, my listener, my one and only listener says, Hey, Timbo, I'm a newish listener of your podcast. Where have you been? By the way, her name is Erin. But I'm an absolute devotee. I'm a massage therapist who has just opened up a shop in Blacksland in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales. That's a nice area. My question is this. How much personality is too much when it comes to marketing my fledgling business? It's a great question. Erin goes on to say, I have what I think is a brilliant, innovative idea for a photo campaign to promote my real, honest approach to massage and my clients. My goodness, where could that go? (laughs) It's not offensive or crude. Phew. However, it is also not based around tall, slender blondes with stones on their backs. Yes, that is a bit of a cliched look, isn't it, for the massage industry? It may be confrontational for some, especially some of the bigger companies I want to target. So, Timbo, do you think I should tone it down or shoot for the stars? It's a great question, Erin. Erin Miller Massage, by the way, .com.au is her website. Well, my short answer is shoot for the stars, quite simply. You know, I see way too much marketing where the business owner has taken the safe way out and opted for bland marketing messages. They think they'll avoid polarising people by being beige. I hate beige. 
by being everything to everyone ends up having you being nothing to no one. You don't stand out. So, Aaron, inject your personality directly into the way you do business, into your marketing copy, into the images you use, the customer experiences you create. Inject it everywhere and make sure this oozes out of all your marketing touch points from your website to your signage to your sales letter copy and everything in between. Because here's the thing, Aaron, in a world of sameness and product or service parity, there is no shortage of masseurs, right? There is a lot of them. Owning your personality in your marketing is, I believe, mission critical. It's what's going to help you stand out from every other masseur in your region. So lean in to your personality, Erin. Shoot for the stars. You might just land on the moon. And thank you for what is an excellent question. Coming up after today's interview, I'll show you where to find some fresh new marketing thinking. But right now, let's meet another successful business owner. Chris Lucas is the visionary behind some of the most in-demand restaurants in Australia, including Chin Chin, Baby Pizza, Kong Barbecue, Hawker Hall, and the brand new Japanese-Korean dining experience, Kasumi. Chris is not only one of the most successful culinary entrepreneurs, that's not easy to say, but a master at creating hype and building raving fans. Plus, he's got endless energy and a creative vision many of us business owners would kill for, seeing opportunities where others don't. He's also a huge supporter of the need to constantly innovate and evolve. Now, like last week's interview, I interviewed Chris at a live event put on by Melbourne technology firm Urban Intelligence, an event which I was lucky enough to emcee. So, please welcome the king of casual dining, Chris Lucas. Now, my son did VCE last year and he did business management as one of his subjects, so I got to start... Uh, having business conversations with him. And we would be driving around and he'd be pointing at restaurants and cafes and saying, Dad, how do they make money? And I sometimes just didn't have an answer for him. What should I have said? Welcome to Australia. (laughs) Have a nice day. (laughs) Welcome to penalty rates. Right. Uh, Well, it's, you know, it's probably, in many ways, it's not much like it. It's not much different to any other sort of retail business. I mean, we we structurally probably... um, uh, face some of the highest uh, labour costs in the, in the Western world and, you know, occupancy costs in Australia are very, very high as well. Um, so it's a tough business. It's it's very competitive business as well, which which makes it even, you know, adds another dimension to it. Mm-hmm. So there's no doubt there's a lot of operators out there who uh, who are probably struggling to make ends meet. But it's a very dynamic industry at the same time and it's also, you know, in terms of if you aggregate the numbers, it's it's one of the largest uh, employers in Australia, if you take the services sector at large, including hotels and tourism and so forth. And it's a fast-growing industry, so everyone wants to be in the restaurant business for some peculiar reason. Yeah, they do. Lifestyle? Oh, look, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, getting into the restaurant business, you know, it's, it's, it's a reasonably affordable still nowadays. Uh, uh, young kids can get into the business just with a few hundred thousand dollars, I guess, opening a little cafe. They get to be their own boss and charter their own destiny mm-hmm. um, and, you know, chance their arm at, uh, at uh, you know, trying to do what they think <laughs> they want to do. Uh, plus there's a whole, you know, there's a whole intellectual movement in terms of food around the world. All of a sudden people are very interested, in particular young people, which is a good thing probably, interested in, in what they eat. Uh, and, you know, what their lifestyle is all about and being healthy and, and conscious about where food comes from, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's become quite a sort of a fashionable thing to, you know, be an expert in coffee or, yeah, you know, no. some sort of particular protein where it's coming from or sustainable products, organic products, et cetera, et cetera. And the celebrity chef movement, I would imagine. Oh, would've... yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, the celebrity thing's a bit, you know, it's, it's there, but it's probably overhyped as... It is itself, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Have you got a favourite uh, celebrity chef? I mean, well, I need to know. Uh, well, Gordon Ramsay's... Uh, I know you like Gordon, Gordon I, I, Well, I know Gordon reasonably well. And I've watched Gordon develop from, a, you know, a, a not-so-famous chef to mm-hmm. obviously one of the most sh- famous chefs in the world. So, Is it all show? 
Pretty much, yeah. No, really? He's a very interesting personality, actually. He's quite a, he's quite a salesman, Gordon. Right. He not does a, swear a lot in real life Oh, as well. well, there you go. It's not yeah. so much show. Yeah. You have got some incredible restaurants. Uh, I said on a phone call to you the other day, I haven't been to any of them, but I absolutely lied, as I said to you earlier. <laughs> I thought you I might have. have been coming from another country. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, don't mind a feed. Um, and they're, they offer a wonderful experience. W where do your ideas come from? Well, you know, it's, uh, to me, it's just a, it's a, it's an instinctual thing. You've got to, you have a sort of a, a gut feel about where you think the market is and it doesn't happen overnight, you know, uh, just like most success stories, I guess they sort of, uh, they come from hard work and many, many decades of understanding what you do and how you apply your art. And uh, uh, to a certain extent, you know, I, I, I go on what I think where the demand is, you know, where the gaps in the market are. And, and quite frankly, even though the market is very congested, you know, if you, look at it, if you look at it from the outside, consumers have an enormous choice in Australia, but not just in food retail, in fashion retail, uh, in, in, you know, in many respects, we're a small population, but we're over-serviced in many, many segments, uh, and food's no different. But I still see a lot of gaps in the market. I see uh, opportunities, perhaps where other people don't see opportunities. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what it comes down okay. to. Okay, can we just delve a bit deeper into that? So can we choose one of your restaurants, you choose, and take us through the process from one day going, I know, mm. I'm going to do that, and mm. then bringing it to market? Well, I mean, uh, Chin Chin's probably the most famous one. You know, it's arguably the busiest restaurant in the country, uh, depending on which way you look at it. But, uh, uh, you know, when, when I was thinking about what, the, what was happening to the market, it was, uh, I just sold one of my businesses back in 2007 and then the sort of GFC had, hit and it had a bit of a, it obviously had a bit of a, uh, an effect on the market. People perhaps weren't going to top end dining restaurants and they were looking for other experiences. But like my poor old father used to say, who was a chef and a publican back in the 40s and 50s, is one thing you can count on is people still need to eat. Correct. Uh, Usually three times a day. In your case, definitely three times a day. Wow. Hey? <laughs> I thought he said that. Maybe I'm dreaming. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it was just a question of trying to come up with a product and a business model that I think, you know, was more relevant to today's diner. And I saw a change in the market. You know, young people obviously were, were thinking more about food and uh, uh, wanting to, to go out more often. They had more disposable income. Uh, uh, but... They didn't want to spend as much money, but they wanted to go out more often. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty simple equation, right? So we basically created a model which was built around redefining the casual dining model. I also felt that uh, people were starting, to, as I said, starting to become more interested in food. So it's been having a bit of a negative impact on the, on the fast casual dining sector, you know, your, your chains and so forth, where people are wanting to improve what they're eating, uh, and uh, and they're also looking for a slightly better experience. So there was a bit of a dynamic change already going on. The industry was sort of slow to grasp it, as you know, as as most industries are. Um, and so my view was that I wanted to sort of drop the pricing to the point where it was almost competitive, let's say, with the fast dining sector, <laughs> but still give them a restaurant experience so that they could afford to go out more often, more regularly, but still have a reasonably good experience. And what we call in the restaurant business, I, it's, it's, I define a restaurant very simply as, uh, as table service. So you don't have to queue up. In McDonald's, you have to go queue up and put your order in, right? So, uh, or you have to drive through. So that's, a, you know, that's the fast casual sector. So I wanted to be able to give people table experience, but you know, keep the spend down to around about $50 a head, let's say, for, a, you know, for an average dining experience, including beverage, mm -hmm. which we managed to do. And all of a sudden, it sort of all, it all worked. It all came together. It was the right time. Uh, uh, the look was right. You know, we still spent just as much money making the place look cool and groovy. And, and uh, we did a few things around the music that was a bit more engaging. We broke a few rules. Like what? Well, you know, we, uh, we dropped the reservations model. So the reservations model was a big change in our industry. Uh, in my view, it held back the industry because, you know, most of the times if you want to go out at night, what's the most common time you want to go eat? Eight. Correct. 7.30 to 8 o'clock. So I've got a whole restaurant sitting there, you know, with staff and chefs prepping away, but most people only want to eat between 7.30 and 8. So we dropped the reservation system. Uh, and just to be clear, in the industry at the time, 
Everyone was taking reservations. Most were people. They? There was hardly any. Right. I mean, you know, other than as I said, the fast casual sector was was obviously you don't do reservations there. But most restaurants had a reservation system. So, so it's interesting. You broke the rules. I mean, we all want to break the rules in the business in order to move forward, in mm. order to differentiate ourselves. For you, is that a big decision, or you well, go? It was a big decision because the media were against me at the time. You know, they were saying that uh, you know we were causing people all sorts of harm. You know, people weren't able to book babysitters, and people wanted to get into the restaurant, but they couldn't get in because they couldn't make a booking and they had to queue up. Uh, so the media sort of ran a bit of a campaign because, uh, you know, the media are the media, as Donald Trump says, you know, <laughs> fake news. And one of the biggest fake news was that people weren't prepared to wait. The funny thing was if you made the experience amazing and you changed the value argument, which is what we did, we brought the experience down to $50 a head on average uh, for a restaurant experience. And so people all of a sudden thought the value argument was amazing. And so they were prepared to wait for it. And if you actually talk to a lot of the young kids, uh, they thought it was pretty cool to wait. You know, they'd go and have a drink or they'd sit on their phone or they'd do all these sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably the other element that came into it was the technology, you know. Instagram, Twitter was just coming on board. And that has also had a huge dynamic shift. All right, well, hold that thought because I want to have a whole marketing discussion. I want to go into it. customer experience, social media. But um, you are big on don't do me too. And there's a lot of businesses, again, there's a lot of businesses we see open that are me too businesses. It's like, again, why would they do that? You're completely against it. That makes sense. Point of difference is everything. Well, I don't know about guests. It's just not... It suit, might suit some people, but... Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't get intellectually interested in, in things that uh, other people have done to a certain extent. I don't want to copy someone else's business or someone else's model. My idea is about trying to capture what I think is right and trying to be creative and do something different. To me, that's... I think, uh, you know, we've established a set of brands that are about doing that, about being innovative, and they create a, a level of excitement, you know. So, uh, uh, I'd rather be in that side of the square at this stage. I mean, there's a lot of people making money in the Me Too side of the business, but, mm -hmm. you know, in what we do, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of uh, brand loyalty that's created by being an innovator, I think. Massive. You talk a lot about redefining the market, which, again, for most business owners, that's a scary proposition. It's much easier to fit into a yeah. market. Yeah. Look, it is true. How, um, do you, how do you redefine a market? Well, you've, you've got to be brave to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't go to bed at night thinking about what, you know, what the risks are. You try to, I try to mentally not even think about the risks, to be quite honest. I mean, I plan for the risks. I mean, we're not stupid. So we take into, we do our normal sort of considerations as to what we think might work and might not work. But I very rarely think about failure. Mm -hmm. Uh, might be a good thing, might be a bad thing, I don't know. But uh, uh, you know. Can I just understand that process inside your head? Do you actually, if fear comes to you, and you just push it aside, or have you uh, trained I, yourself? Or you never, you've no, never feared. Uh, anything? I've never really feared much, right. other it's than my wife. Is you know, big, my, I fear my wife, but you know that's normal, isn't it? So <laughs> yeah, very normal. Now yeah, she's my ex-wife, so big there, you know. spider on your shoulder. But don't worry about that. Um, okay, so I fear my children. They should oh, like, yeah, scare yeah, the shit yeah. out of me as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, as as you add more restaurants to your portfolio, yeah. how do you maintain them? Because it's quite a, it's quite a, it's a trendy industry, right? Mm. How do you maintain momentum and interest and not become just a fad? Well, food retail is no different to fashion retail, you know. Which is pretty fickle. Well, it can be fickle. But look, if you've got a good product and you continue to do what I believe in, which is innovate, continue to uh, constantly evolve your business model, uh, not less on your roles and continue to create product that's exciting, um, I, you know, it's, it takes the fickleness out of it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as I said, it does, it does happen to, to, uh, to be positive in the fact that we're in an industry, as I said, that's, you know, it's an energetic industry. People want to know about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been, to a, I've been to a lot of, uh, been to a few political dinners and a few business dinners where we sit around and, you know, there's the head of some big corporation here and the head of the bank over here and, you know, people go around and say, what do you do, what do you do? Black says, oh, I'm the managing director of XYZ and I'm the chairman of this. And then they go, what do you do? I said, oh, run restaurants. They go, oh, really? You run right. restaurants, you know? And all they want to do is talk about restaurants. It's a sort of a... It's Social. a personal experience. I think people... Uh, it's an opinion-based business. You, mm -hmm. you know, you go to a restaurant, you have a very personal experience when you walk into a restaurant. You know, you don't like this or you do like that or you want your food in this particular way. 
So you've got to sort of dig into that and make sure that uh, you know, you're on top of it. So you're only as good as your last meal, as they say in our business. Let's talk marketing because you mentioned the word brand before. And again, mm. you're one of these restaurateurs that you are, you build these individual brands that have so much, much depth and emotional, many people attach emotionally mm. to them. There's a lot of restaurants out there like the local Thai restaurant near where I live. I mean, it's not a brand. Mm. It's a very functional restaurant. What is the key to building a brand? Well, uh, um, I took a particular view a few years ago that the, uh, as opposed to, say, America, which is, a, you know, 350 million people, probably 100 million live, uh, you know, on the basic wage uh, and maybe another 30 or 40 million live, you know, below the poverty line, so to speak, which is a bit of an indictment about America. But, uh, you know, you've got an enormous powerful base there that basically feeds off, you know, low based commodity based restaurants, fast food chains, you know, which is why a hamburger chain, if it's successful, can open up 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. Uh, some businesses can get through that growth in a very, very quick period of time because they're able to scale up. Um, <clears throat> in Australia, the, the fast food sector, which is what most people that see brands and understand brands as in terms of the food mm. business, uh, you know, uh, is, is got a lot of structural barriers to it. So it has a limitation in the sense that uh, it has a ceiling in the, in the sense that you're only prepared to pay so much for, let's say, a burger. I mean, you probably won't pay $30 or $40 for a burger, but... <clears throat> I, I would, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you, there's a ceiling usually around about $10, let's say, right? Um, so you can't really add to that experience in Australia. So you've got to... You, that's why these fast casual brands have to have multiple sites. But in Australia, it's tough. You've got, as I said, the highest labour cost in the Western world. You've got a scarcity of, of cheap labour. Um, and you've got some of the highest property prices in the Western world again. So you've got huge occupancy cost. It costs more to fit out our businesses in, um, in Australia than mm. it does in America. And so these structural inefficiencies and these barriers, I think, <clears throat> mean that we can't scale up in Australia as quickly or as significantly as you can in, in America. So the fast casual sector in Australia, to me, from a brand development point of view, has got some limitations. Sure, there's already, you know, some well-established brands and they dominate the market, but they're struggling with growth as well. You know, if you look at your McDonald's and so forth, and even chains like Grilled, which have tried to do something different, are hitting a sort of a ceiling, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, but, so my view was to, to try and create a brand identity, but to do it with multiple different brands, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So it was about trying to step away from that part of the commodity business and move it more into a business where we could change the value argument, you know? Still make it, as I said, a restaurant experience, drive the cost down through making the restaurants as busy as we possibly can, so we took away the reservation systems. And then we sort of really worked on making the brands exciting. I mean, um, I know what's so exciting about going to a Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet, right? But there's a lot of excitement in going to Hawker Hall. Okay, so let's, let's go there, because Hawker Hall is a great experience of customer experience. And in a world of sameness, customer experience these days seems to be a way of differentiating a business, right? Mm. So how do you go about, do, do you timeline out from the moment someone comes into contact with Hawker Hall, these are the, these are the hoops they're gonna go through to enjoy themselves? Or how do you create and identify uh, that experience? Well, you know, there's a guy called Stephen Starr in America that runs a, a really uh, quite successful business group. Again, <clears throat> multiple concepts. Uh, you might have heard of a restaurant, for instance, like Budokan in New York, which, was, which is a very famous restaurant in New York. It's, when you go into it, it's sort of like a nightclub come sort of Chinese restaurant, right? He was a, uh, uh, he was a film producer from, uh, from Philadelphia. Uh, stage shows, uh, movies. Uh, he took his entertainment model and I think put it into a food model and created uh, dynamic, fun restaurants to go to. Uh, so <clears throat> he changed the whole dynamic of the restaurant industry. It went from being a place to just go and eat something and basically turned it into an all-night affair, you know, in, and he also made his restaurants large-scale format. So he, he, he became the, the bunnings of the restaurant industry, if that's, a, if that's a sort of an analogy, in the sense that it's a one-stop shop. You can go and you can go to a bar, you can go to a restaurant, you can go to a noodle shop, you can have dumplings, uh, all in this $25, $30 million facility, wow. which uh, had thumping music through the whole place. Uh, and all of a sudden, these large-scale format 
large footprint businesses started generating huge amounts of cash. You know, it became, I think, one of the busiest restaurants in New York, one of the businesses busiest in America. They did another model of it in uh, in Vegas, where uh, one single restaurant was turning over 70 million US. Uh, the one in New York was doing about 35 million US, which you know, was unheard of before mm -hmm. in the old restaurant industry. And it also made the experience, as I said, a, a sort of an entertainment one. So people then started to realise that restaurants could be something more than just a, uh, uh, a traditional eating house. Mm -hmm. And that allowed us, if we, allowed us as well, to, to, to try and look at that model, use it as inspiration, which is what we've done with our businesses. And it allows you to also add on then. So there's no limitation anymore. It's not the $10 burger. You know, we can sell you a cocktail. Uh, we can sell you a cookbook, you know, we can sell you all sorts of things. Uh, so it's, uh, it's about uh, creating the right environment, making people feel that the value experience is something different to everywhere else. And all of a sudden, in some ways, they're actually spending just as much as they used to in a traditional restaurant. You know, they might end up spending 200 bucks a head because by the time they've had a few cocktails, buy a cookbook, you know, buy, buy this or buy that, they're up to that sort of thing. But they feel as if the experience has been an affordable one. Do you actually map it out? I, I interviewed a, a, an electrician about a year ago and he had a... It's a large electrician franchise in Australia. The owner had mapped out a 21-step customer experience mantra. Every time a Sparky went to a home or business, in order, these are the 21 steps that they mm. had to follow. And as a result, it was a consistent experience, it was a good experience and people talked about it. Mm. Do you go, and, and, and as all the business owners in this room, whether there's a vet or a lawyer or an accountant, they can still offer an experience. Mm. Do you go to that level of detail? And not quite to that level of detail. I, I started my career, I, was a, I did pharmacology at the university, which, uh, you know, uh, was probably a mistake. I know that the head of the faculty told me to never, ever, ever go into that business because <laughs> I'd probably kill someone. So uh, he said, what are you good at? I said, oh, I don't know. What, what do you think I'm good at? You reckon I'm no good at mixing up drugs? He said, well, he said, you should just go into this, be a salesman. Sell drugs. So I said, I said, well, I don't want to sell drugs. That's a bit boring. He said, look, there's a company called IBM. I said, Who, who's that? He said, it's the world's biggest computer company. This is back in 1979, right? <laughs> so I joined IBM at the time as a trainee salesman. Uh, and... IBM's mantra, because IBM was arguably at the time, this was well before Apple, uh, was probably the leading company in the world in terms of marketing. I mean, it was a great marketing mm. machine, right? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the first thing I learned was that the customer is the number one person. He's in, they used to have the saying, uh, if, a salesman, if a salesman doesn't sell anything, no one else gets a job, right? So... So, uh, and the customer's always right and the customer's always first. So, within reason. So, they used to have all these sort of mock sales uh, experiences they used to set up in the training facilities. And the other thing I learned from them is that it's all about training. Mm -hmm. It's about investing in your people, making sure they understand the culture and, and, and understand the experience that you're trying to, to, to give your customer. So, I basically... You know, learnt that. I got that drilled into me when I was when I first went into the workforce, and I apply that to our business. It doesn't matter. I mean, you've probably been to a lot of cool and trendy restaurants, and you get some young kid with a thing stuck through their nose and long hair and a few tats on them, and looking down their nose, saying to you, "Oh, you know, I'm not sure I can do this for you," or "You know, we're really busy," or "Gee, you know, I'm not so sure I can find you a table." That doesn't happen in our places. So us, it's uh, you know, it's as soon as you walk in the door, it's a big smile on their face. We call them the gatekeepers, right? So we put a lot of training because it doesn't matter how good your business is, one kid with the wrong attitude can undo all your assets, all your good work, right? Because they're the link between you and the customer that comes in the door. So most business owners find people the most difficult part of running a business. How do you attract and retain the good ones? Well, look, you know, it's again, it's, you've got to create a model that's exciting for us. Most of our employees are under the age of 30. So, uh, you know, it's about dealing with, uh, with that, 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 you know, that youthfulness. So we create an environment which is cool to work in. It's a bit, you know, it's a bit like, uh, a bit like the Google of the restaurant industry mm -hmm. to a certain extent. You know, they can sort of, they're free will in my place a bit. So they don't feel as if they have the total sort of uh, normal structural uh, elements that they would have in a normal workplace. But at the same time, we, we set very, very sort of... Uh, uh, high benchmarks in terms of, you know, the customer first experience. We spend a lot of mo lot of money on training, probably more than anyone else in the industry for the type of business we are. 
Uh, what, the obvious training, or, or is there some not so obvious training? No, there's not so obvious. We, we do a lot of cultural training. I mean, look, at the end of the day, you can train someone as much as you like, they still might screw up, right? Because the brain can only take so much. Uh, and they tend to forget it when they're in a pressure situation. So we work a lot on culture. I think, and then we let them go, because I think if they've got the right cultural attitude, i.e., for instance, the customer is right in my, in my business, uh, then they can make their decisions on the run, knowing full well in the back of their mind, well, Chris Lucas wants his customers to be happy, yep. and, uh, uh, and then they can make their own decisions based on the cultural aspects. So for us, it's all about culture. We don't always get it right. It's a tough business. Our kids aren't the, you know, today they, they sort of tend to know a little bit more than what they thought they, know, they do. They think so, they do, yeah. Yeah, but look, the other, on the flip side is that they're, they're very intellectual. They're well-trained most of the day. They're well-read. They can flick through their iPhone and pick up just about anything, they, anything you want and they grasp it very quickly. So, um, uh, and they're a lot taller, which is always good too, you know, nowadays. I don't know what they've been fruity. Well, that's, that's all right, exactly. <laughs> so so it's, about, um, it's about making sure that we're just gelling with that de- generation but making sure that there are still some old-fashioned values that matter. And does that apply in the background to all your restaurants? Yeah. So there's, there's a sort of... Uh, a continuity between it applies continuity. to everyone in our business. Right. IT, HR, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we put a lot of people from headquarters into the restaurants. Uh, you know, we cross our fingers a bit. You know, when we've got an accountant <laughs> sitting there in the restaurant, but it's it's a good experience for them. They've got to see what it's like uh, to deal with customers. Uh, and uh, deal with customer demands. Speaking of IT, what role technology? We're here on behalf of Urban Intelligence. Mm-hmm. What role technology? Well, for us, there's, there's a couple elements. Uh, you know, uh, we've got our own disruptor, which, you know, is the, f- the, the food delivery business at the mm-hmm. moment, which is... Um, Melbourne has become the number one... Uh, sorry, the number two uh, uh, Uber Eats uh, delivery business in the world. So, so just, I think London's number wow. one. Melbourne's number two, and it's only been in business for 12 months. So the pent-up demand was huge because we didn't have a delivery network in, in this country, really. Uh, you know, Domino's had really broke the model there by uh, rationalising their stores and going to a delivery o- online business, which they've done very successfully. But the rest of the industry had to grapple with hiring bicycle riders and insurance and, and you know, and paying people 50 bucks an hour on a Sunday to do that. So... Uh, you know, it, it, we never really had a, what I would call an established delivery service. But the demand was there. All of a sudden, these guys come in, uh, they provide a really swish IT platform, which mm-hmm. is the apps, um, and they've obviously, you know, obviously got a driver network established. So all of a sudden, uh, a business has been created out of nothing. Um, and in fact, Uber Eats, I think, is growing at a faster rate than their normal app business, their normal driver business in a lot of the developed countries at the moment. Have you seen an impact? Yeah, well, we're on it. You can't, you know, you can't be not on it. Uh, We've had to restructure our restaurants to be able to cope with this whole genre. So we've had... Was that difficult? Yeah, it is. It is because, you know, restaurants are designed to feed people in their restaurant. Uh, Our food is designed to be served in a restaurant. So it comes to you hot, usually at your table. Uh, to try and restructure your menu and restructure your kitchens and your resources to be able to then transport food, even though there's a five-kilometre radius, uh, it's still significant. So we've had to do a lot of work in doing that, but we recognised that was a business opportunity. It wasn't going to go away. It was something that we had to deal with, and we've taken it on as a positive. But we were, we were worried about our brand. I mean, we didn't want our food arriving cold, you know, uh, it's a negative. It's a negative for our brand. So we had to make sure that the experience was as best as we possibly can be. So that's one. That's one area that we've had to deal with, and I think it's here to stay. Uh, uh, where it goes in the next couple of years will be interesting because uh, Uber is, I think, learning the business themselves. Mm. They're not quite sure where it's going. Uh, they just want to. They just have a very simple philosophy, which is they don't care whether they make money or not at the moment, and they're losing a lot of money doing this business. Um, But as a philosophy generally for business owners in the room, we don't all know what we're doing, right? I mean, do you know every move that you make? They really don't know what they're doing, so... uh, (laughs) That's a bit scary, given it's sort of... For a company worth about 80 billion. Yeah, correct. Um, How does that work? How is that worth 80 billion? uh, He's actually an interesting exercise, uh, the CEO of... uh, of Uber, he's he's uh, he pushes his he pushes his limits. There's no doubt about it. He's even pushed his limits with Apple to the point that Apple were going to drop his app. So 
uh, which would have been a, you know, a yeah. major problem. So he, his view is that he wants to dominate the marketplace depending on what sector they go into. <laughs> and he makes no qualms about it. And he's burning a lot of cash to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I guess to a certain extent, Amazon hadn't, didn't make a lot of money for almost 10 years. And even now, today, there's a lot of parts of their business that don't really make a lot of money or they're very, very small margin. The big money is actually in their cloud business. Mm -hmm. So people don't really know that. But Amazon is actually really an IT company, right? It just happens to be uh, an e-retailer. So a lot of their money is coming out of their, their cloud services business, which is growing at a phenomenal rate. So that's one disruptor. The other one is um, social media. For us, social media has been a, a huge change in the way um, restaurants operate. I mean, you probably see it today. You go into a restaurant, you know, there's kids sitting around a table and no one's talking to each other. They're just taking photos of the food or taking photos of each other or taking photos of their girlfriend or <laughs> doing whatever and posting it. Uh, so... Uh, you know, that's, that's been a phenomenal change, a great change. Great change for Great you. change for us. It was, it was interesting, you know, we had a, a lot of people in the in industry going, oh, I don't want people taking photos of my food, I don't think it's right, it's disrupting the customer experience. You know, our view was, you Get know... Get it out there. Open the doors, come yep. in, take as many photos as <laughs> you like, right? I'll pose with you if you want as well, <laughs> right? So, because at the end of the day, it was free marketing. Totally. Free marketing. And uh, it was like standing in front of a, a tsunami. It was, it, it, there was no chance you were going to stop people from taking photos in your restaurant, right? So get on board, which we did. We were probably the, the, you know, the leaders. I guess my IT background probably helped a bit to get onto it quicker than most. I, I remember sort of, it might have been 2010, 2009, you know, that whole Apple phenomena, retail Apple phenomena was just happening. I was in New York and I was in a really cool, hip hotel, the Mercer in Soho. And I was sitting down in the bar restaurant area and, and looking at all the beautiful models and uh, uh, every one of them had a laptop yeah. or, a, or an iPad or a phone, right? And hardly anyone... In fact, I saw one family, there was two kids and parents, all four had laptops, right? Um, you know, the smartphone thing was just coming, just coming on. on. Instagram hadn't started. And I was looking at it and I was thinking to myself, uh, other than it's a bit sad no one's talking to each other, um, uh, that... You know, this, the, the pervasiveness of yeah, of, uh, of social media is here. Yeah. It's here to stay, and it's a big part of what we do. Yeah. So well, we hoping. built a business around communicating our brands through social media. There you go, team. Melbourne's king of casual dining, culinary entrepreneur extraordinaire, Chris Lucas. What a powerhouse, hey? Coming up, I'm going to share my top three attention grabbers from that chat with Chris. Plus, I've got another low-cost marketing idea for you. The Small Business Big Marketing Show is made possible thanks to Open Universities Australia. As business owners, we're more likely to work in our business than on it. Who's guilty of that? Come on, hands up. Hands up. I certainly am. We get so caught up in the busyness of business but it doesn't have to be that way. You see, you can study a postgraduate single unit online through Open Universities Australia. You could sharpen your accounting skills, deep dive into economics. You, you could even improve your marketing if you can't find a decent podcast on the topic. And trust me, I've tried. <laughs> Seriously, though, having interviewed hundreds of successful business owners, one thing many have in common is they never, ever stop learning. So be one of them and sharpen your skills by checking out the single modules on offer at Open Universities Australia over at www.open.edu.au. And we're also made possible thanks to Dale Beaumont's 52 Ways Live event. Now, instead of me telling you about it, and I have done that over the last few months and have attended it myself, loved it, here's a note I just received from listener Nerily. She says, hi, Timbo. Hey, Nerily. Long time listener here. Well, I feel like it, although I'm still catching up. I listen at least to at least one or two of your podcast episodes a day while I'm in my studio. That's unreal. Some have background jibber jabber on, others have my show on, <laughs> which could be regarded as background jibber jabber. She goes on to say, I just want to say thanks for the info on Dale Beaumont's 52 Ways event. 
I went yesterday and came away hugely positive and pumped. I love that. Well done for taking action uh, narrowly. Many don't. Many would have heard me speak about it, not gone. But that said, I know many of you have gone to great benefit. She goes on to say, it's been a really hard few months. I'm sorry to hear that. But now I'm getting back on track. I just wanted to say thanks. You're a legend narrowly. So here's the thing, guys. We've got to get out of our businesses. We've got to get out and smell the roses, look around, go to events, expand our mind, meet other business owners, um, you know, experience what they're going through, hear their challenges, hear about their wins. And an event like 52 Ways allows you to do that. It's eight hours of learning, and it is like it is. Dale says, shares 52 ways to grow your business in eight hours. I mean, it's brilliant. If nothing else, just watch him present. He's a machine. You can learn a lot from that. Anyway, uh, 2018 dates have been announced and free tickets are available over at 52ways.biz. And I would highly encourage you to get a group of fellow business owners and marketers together and head off for the day and have a ball. 52 ways, 52 ways. Dot B-I-Z. My top three attention grabbers from that chat with Chris Lucas, thanks to Open Universities Australia and 52ways.biz. Attention grabber number one, go where the demand is and find a gap in the market. I love that thinking of Chris's. Learn to see opportunities where others don't, and in doing so, avoid doing me too. As Chris said, doing me too doesn't intellectually interest him, and I would suggest it shouldn't intellectually interest you either. You know, copying others, eh, put your own spin on things. Find out what people want, I reckon. Chris reckons. We all reckon. Attention grabber number two, Come up with a product and business model more relevant to today's customer. I like this. Sometimes we do things just because that's how everyone does them. Maybe it's time to break a few rules and do things differently. Innovate and constantly evolve your business model, just like Chris is with all his restaurants. Can't wait to see what he comes up with next, really. Attention grabber number three, look for fun places to take your clients suppliers and staff. Now, this is not something Chris and I spoke about, but that chat reminded me of an idea I shared in a past episode where I suggested us business owners should never eat alone, or at least once a week, we should get out of the office and have a business lunch with someone of influence. I'm catching up with an overseas listener for dinner tonight. They reached out, they said they're in town. Happy days. Free meal, I think too. (laughs) <laughs> no such thing as a free meal, is there? Hey, what grabbed your attention? Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 382 is where you can leave a comment. What, 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 what. what have you got to lose? It's time for one simple yet effective marketing idea that you can implement immediately. One that won't cost a fortune and that might just generate you more awareness, more inquiry, and ultimately, more sales. ka I call today's idea the look beyond your own backyard hack. Now, I know some of you are so flush with ideas to get more customers that you're spoiled for choice. Let's face it, you've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show for how long? And you've got a list as long as your arm. If that's you then it's time to implement. But what if that's not you? What if you're part of that group of business owners who are staring at a blank page, who are stuck for ideas? This is not a fun place to be. Don't stress though, because the answer is just outside your door, over the fence and around the corner. Here's my three steps to helping you look beyond your own backyard. Step one, Acknowledge that all the great marketing ideas do not live solely inside your industry. In fact, if you only ever look to what others in your industry are doing, then you're limiting yourself and holding your business back in a very big way. 
Accepting this will place you in a mindset to be more open to other ways of getting more customers. Step two, start to look at the way businesses in completely unrelated industries market themselves. If you're a real estate agent, then flick through some clothing catalogues. If you're a vet, then go to a gaming conference. If you're a cafe owner, then check out jewellery shops. Get the idea? And step three, when you see a marketing idea you like, ask yourself, how could I implement this in my business? Don't be too literal, as the idea may not translate directly into your business, but it may spark something that does. And here's the pro tip, team. When you do see an idea you love, don't be afraid to contact the business owner and ask them questions about it. Who designed it? Was it hard to implement? How has it worked for them? They're in an unrelated business, so they should be more than happy to share. That's my three steps to looking beyond your own backyard. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 382 where you'll find a link to this post plus some additional resources to bring this idea to life, including 25 hotel marketing ideas and 10 content marketing ideas for accounting firms. Quite mind-expanding if you're not a hotel owner or an accountant. Plus, you'll find a link to a copy of my marketing book, The Boomerang Effect, which is really all you need. So, what have you got to lose? Alrighty, what an episode. That almost wraps up the Small Business Big Marketing Show for this week. But don't worry, there's plenty of marketing gold coming your way in the weeks ahead. Some really, really good interviews lined up and a whole lot more. Hey, have you listened to the chat I had with Yoop Penance? That's his name, Yoop Penance. He's the creator of the tiny house concept called Shacky, which came to him during a stressful part of his life. In 2015, in July, I came to Australia with my with my girlfriend, who is Australian. You know, we were just in a hectic stage of our lives, mm-hmm. and we got to Australia and thought, you know, we just we just need a break. We just need to get out. And I found this really cute little cabin in in the bush near Melbourne, and it didn't have internet, it didn't have electricity, it didn't have a TV, it didn't have anything apart from a bed and a potbelly stove. And we stayed there for two nights or three nights, and we thought, man, this is just absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. We haven't sat down for in months and just looked out the window or listened to the birds outside. And I I started to hear more and more of these cases around me of people that said, you know, I just need a break. And the term digital detox uh, started coming up, people that needed a detoxification from all their digital appliances, from Facebook, Mm -hmm. from Instagram, from, from their emails coming in. And I thought, you know, it's, apparently I'm not the only one that feels this way. And it's such a addition to your life if you take a break for a weekend or for a few nights. And that's how Shaki was born. Airbnb are even using them in their promotions. Such a great concept. You'll find that full interview plus hundreds more over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com or you can subscribe free on iTunes. Love to hear from you. Email me. Tim at Tim Reed, R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. Hit me up on Twitter at Timbo Reed. Join the, the Spacebook. <laughs> it should be Spacebook. Join the Small Business Big Marketing Facebook page. All those ways we can get connected. I love that. Hey, don't forget to sharpen your sword by enrolling in one of the single module online courses offered by Open Universities Australia. Never stop learning, team. Check them out, open.edu.au. And be sure to grab your free seat at Dale Beaumont's 52 Ways live event. New dates have just been released in 2018. You've got no excuses. It is a full day of solid content that will help you grow your business. Head over to 52, that's 52ways.biz. If you love the small business big marketing show, then let another business owner know about it. Grab their phone, open up the podcast app, Look for the Small Business Big Marketing Show, hit subscribe, give them their phone back, walk off. (laughs) They'll love you forever, and I'll love you even more. Until next week, I'm Timbo Reid. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now. 